Welcome back to Pastor Plex Podcast. I'm your host, Pastor Plex, with my really sweet wife here, Adrian Plugpole. We've now been married for 13 years. Yep. <laughs> and also in studio with us is none other than Machine Gun Nick. Welcome, Machine Gun Nick. I had a 13 year marriage, it ended. <laughs> You know, way to make it 13 years, though. It's pretty good. It yeah. is pretty, pretty good. I'm proud of it. <laughs> Three of those were in separation. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay, so um, we're, we're talking about the message from this past Sunday where we looked at Luke 22, and we started at verse 35 all the way to verse 53. And Pastor Mo, uh, none other than Muhammad Ali, brought the word, and it was a fantastic word. Uh, what was your initial thoughts on that sermon, Adrian? Well, I enjoyed the sermon. Felt like Mo, you know, kind of came into himself a little bit. Oh, yeah. People don't know that Mo is pretty funny. So, yeah. So, you you think that this was like his, like, I'm a funny person moment. I think it was like my true colors. I'm going to sh- start showing them. Okay. Yeah. I've built enough rapport with yeah. enough trust. The, the, the funny is coming out. Yeah. He's taking some risks with his jokes. I like mm-hmm. that. What was the risk he took? Well, he made a... Second Amendment joke that was that, pretty. That good. was funny. Yeah, that was funny. And he uh, talked about the ma- the male affection in a way that was like you know a little bit enjoyable. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about what uh, the big emphasis that he put on was. What will you do with God's son? And initially, the the, the sermon was sort of broken down to three different parts. There's part one where uh, Jesus is telling the disciples there's going to be a change of mission, a frago, if you will. Uh, Machine Gun Nick, how'd you feel about this frago? Well, so it it was kind of confusing because we get this like, hey, don't don't travel with your cl- with your uh, bag or, Money. or a sword. And then Jesus is like, hey, uh, trade in your cloak for a sword. So, you know, the machine gun part of me is like, yeah, here we go. And then and then we go and get the swords, right? And right. then Jesus is like, wait a minute, but don't use them. Of course, they're they're like in the process of using them and they're like, hey Jesus, is this okay? What can we find out Peter's a horrible swordsman? <laughs> misses the head completely, but takes an ear off a soldier. Right. And then Jesus goes and puts it back on, and we're kind of, uh, I'm even here like, but you said get the swords, right? Right? You know, that Second Amendment part, hey, you want me to arm <laughs> up, we're going to go do this, and we've only gone over this, Plek, if you don't tell me no, people, you know, yeah, right, people right. are going to get hurt. Yeah, we, we, we mentioned that about, that's why you have officers in the military, because if you kill off the officer in other armies... Then that everyone just waits for they go defensive posture right. until an officer shows up. Whereas yes. with the American Army, that's where they just start killing everything. That's exactly right. Yeah. Like, oh, he's gone, and there's really horrible feeling inside. But the rest of me is like, and now we commence. Right. <laughs> They're all gonna die. Right. Um, okay. So let's talk about uh, Jesus' change of mission. He says to them, uh, essentially, like before. When I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? And they're like, nothing. And he says, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled. He was numbered with the transgressors, for it is written about, for what is written me about me has its fulfillment. And he say, hey, here, Jesus, we've got two swords, and that's enough. Now, what I just thought was, to your point, The very next thing uh, that happens, they pray on the Mount of Olives, and then um, they Judas comes, betrays Jesus, and when those around them saw what would follow, meaning the (laughs) band of merry men and swords, Lord, shall we strike with a sword? And then one of the one of them struck the servant, the high priest, and cut off his right ear. So. Like, literally what you just said. Hey, make sure, guys, make sure you have swords. We got two swords. Oh, that's great. We got, man, that's what we needed. And then he goes and whacks off somebody. Should I be doing this? And I think that that is, a, that is confusing. Now, I when I read um, about the sword, Jesus specifically says it, they must be numbered with the transgressors. So I think this had to do with you can't be an unarmed transgressor. I think it just looks bad in the transgressor world. You know, you got to have somebody, like whenever you arrest somebody, you know, do they have any guns? No, they're on pri- and they're on private. Pri- I mean, I don't know. Maybe this will to make it look have an appearance of some sort of righteousness for the sake of um, him being numbered with the transgressors. I don't know. I, 
I think some people can take this does you know that was not for people to defend themselves uh, because Jesus wanted to be numbered with the transgressors and that was fulfill scripture for him, but so that doesn't necessarily apply to us. Anyway, there's a lot that you can go into that. Um, personally, I think you are allowed to defend yourself. However, um, the mindset you have is that ultimately it's not about fighting. It's about winning people for Jesus, which, duh. Any, any thoughts on that from you guys? <sighs> no. Did you just get lost on that one? No, I got it. So it's, it's he, didn't, we, he didn't tell them to get a sword because it was about the fight. Right, he got tell him to get a sword for the appearance of being transgressors. Do you think that's true? I mean, that's what it says. I mean, so we get the sword, so that when they come for us, they have more to put against us. They have a reason to actually arrest us. Right, and so, it, but is it necessarily? And this is where it gets challenging. Is the sword for the next meeting with Judas, or? And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag, knapsack, or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said to them, but now, so he's going on a missional statement. But now, let the one who has a money bag take it, likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that scripture must be fulfilled, and he was numbered with the transgressors. So the, the only time he's ever going to be traveling ever again in the history of his life is in this next moment of going to the Mount of Olives. Right. So Mo makes it sound like the sword was like not a sword. It was the word of God. But we don't believe that. Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, they didn't have like two words of God hanging around. Well, do you remember the sermon? Yeah, I, I think I think he's meaning... So in a literal sense, he literally means swords. Maybe in the future sense... He means word He could of mean God. word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. Maybe... But he means real swords, right? But now. I mean, right here he's talking about real swords because you wouldn't carry a Bible around to be numbered with the transgressors. Right. Right. On the flip side of this, are they going to need swords in the future? Mm. Because they do all die like horrible deaths, right? Yeah, except for John, he just gets exiled. And whenever they die, they willingly submit. They go they take the civil disobedience route to its death. And um Except, do we really think I would have them get a sword just to look like a part? I don't think so. It, well, yeah. I mean, if it serves the the prophecy, then yes. Yeah, I I, I totally. There you go. I do think that's what is serving uh, the prophecy. I, I do think that's what um, is challenging about this. Is is where in the. <laughs> yeah, where are they? When they when they take the move to the Mount of Olives, they've got. The, it's not like they didn't. Ha they always had the swords, right? It's not like they, d you know, they had to go sell a cloak and buy swords. They had swords with them the whole time, and they were just like, "Hey, Jesus, two swords good, or do we need more?" And Jesus was like, "Ah, oh, that's enough." I, so it's not like they didn't have swords before. I, I think that's the thing that's okay. It's not like they were like, "Oh, crud, we need to find a sword around here." No, they they had swords. And so they take him with them, as they had probably been doing before. But he was talking about in the intentional missionary movement, make sure that you go armed. Um, the problem with it is, uh, is he ha Jesus has to be numbered with the transgressors. So maybe it's prophecy, maybe it's pre preparation, or I, I thought, you know, it, that's where it could be both things. Um, Okay. Anyway, yeah, I, I I think that's something that it's worth it's worth debating over, um, but it's 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 a weird it's a weird connection here. Um, we can come back to that in a bit. Uh, all right. What about um, this next part though? I think is is fascinating for me. Uh, is what about when Jesus goes to the garden? Right, he's praying. He's got the disciples with him. He drops off nine of the disciples, or yeah, eight of the disciples. And then he takes the next three with him to, to go to stay close to him, Peter, James, and John. And uh, then they start praying. He's in absolute agony. It's the wee hours of the night. They don't really know what's going on. They're falling asleep. Jesus is like, hey, wake up. Don't fall into temptation. And then he goes a stone's throw, and he says, um, Lord, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. 
And then he is then strengthened by an angel of some sort. So when you guys read that, are, to me, this might be the most impactful part of the entire Bible. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you would you agree? Oh, I think it's up there, yeah. Yeah, so and here's why. He's saying, I don't want to drink the wrath of God. Uh I want to not. I I if there's another way. Um so how do you guys that's that to me is just wild. How do you handle that? I want another way. Well, I see it as perhaps the most humanistic view of Jesus right there. Like here, like, because we see him as the son of God, and he can make all these miracles happen, mm -hmm. and he go forty days in the desert with temptation and not take it, and so he's like this, this like, I mean, that is awesome. Like, I don't know if I could do any of that. Well, obviously I can't, right? Mm -hmm. But then we see him now. Here's this final step, and it's going to be like the hardest, and he's actually going to feel all the pain and all the suffering, and he's going to have to go through all of that. And he's like, but God, do I really have to do that? And that, to me, is, like, the most – it makes him human. Like, at this point in time, he is not just the son of God. He's also a human. Yeah, I and agree. you see it. Right. I mean, he's 100% man, 100% God at all times. Right. And when he goes to the cross, he's, what he's asking is his father, if there's another way. If, if we can do Islam, if Muhammad is the way, then let's do it that way. If um, – the five pillars or if like we can get karma to work out or if there's some enlightened sort of state, if there's any other way, let's do it that way and not by me having to take on the wrath of God that I've been, as Jesus would say, I, he has been dishing out the wrath of God. Now he's going to be on the receiving end of it. And it's so terrifying that, I mean, we see Jesus in all sorts of situations. Like everybody wants to kill him. He walks through the crowd. Uh, he, when somebody is is dead he raises them from the dead like there's nothing that would should freak him out but here he is sweating drops of blood in the garden of gethsemane begging the disciples to pray with him and they can't because they're so tired it's because i don't think anybody can possibly fathom what it meant to look the wrath of god full on yeah um and so i think Agreed. that's like that's the, whenever i was in um the army uh when i was 22 23 I had another lieutenant that was like 10 years older than me, uh, and he was a, a former SF guy that had become an officer. And we would hang out, and uh, we would he would have, always have like Christian tapes on and stuff, and and whenever we would talk, he just he would just kind of repeat this. If there was any other way, if there was any other way, it was like on repeat in my head. Then then he would do it that way, but there wasn't. That's why the Garden of Gethsemane is so important. There is no other way. I just can hear Sam. That was his name. Sam Cohn was just in my head all the time about. There was no other way. If there was any other way for anyone to be saved, it would have been done because Jesus asked for it. And that's why if you are a Christian, and, and I think this becomes important, if you're a Christian and you claim um, that there is another way other than Jesus, like maybe, you know, I don't know. This is where, I don't know why you, if you're a Christian, if you would ever do this, but let's just say you're claiming to be a Christian and you're like, well, you know, people who have never heard could go to heaven because, you know, God would have mercy on them. Then why wouldn't Jesus say like, then don't tell anybody I'm doing this because the moment someone hears about it, then they are now somehow um, on the hook guilty of, not, of rejecting the son of God. Whereas if they could be just completely ignorant, that would be a blessing to them. And so what I, I think the reality is whether you are, you 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 are not no you have no knowledge of who Jesus is because you haven't heard of a Jesus yet, or whether you've been you know go, been to church a zillion times and just reject him out outright. You the wrath of God is coming like gravity is coming like the way fire burns. I think this is where we want to view God. We over personalize God and don't understand the holy, holiness of God, and so therefore Jesus has to die and then impute His righteousness to us, and we and He imputes our sin to Him. I think that becomes so important. Which I, I feel like that's a part of this that I don't ever want to over, or I want to overdo because I think it's that important to communicate. There is no other way other than to put your full faith and trust in what Jesus has done for us on the cross. All right, did I land the plane on that? Yeah. <laughs> I do like it. I think that it is. Um, I think it shows 
how I think it's easy to look at the crucifixion and focus on the crucifixion as the as the like climax of the right. punishment. And it just wasn't that. Right. The climax is right here in the garden. Well, or maybe I would say the climax is hell. Sure. Okay. That would be the hell. Yeah. yeah. That is on the cross then. Oh, he experiences hell while he's on the cross. Mm -hmm. Not until he dies, right? No. My God, my God, why have you forsaken oh, so me? So he's experiencing hell alive. Uh -huh. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I thought that's what happened when he was in the tomb. No. So remember when it, because I mean, it's, I mean, now this is where we're getting to the, the part that you don't know about is from his death uh, at, at Friday at, um, you know, three o'clock ish um, to Easter or, you know, the resurrection Sunday. You don't know wh where he went. You just know that he went, he descended into hell. Right. I always assumed that, that after his death, he descended into hell. But, you know, who cares? It doesn't really matter. The well, fact no, no, is but, I, but I think, I, yeah, I think experiencing hell on the cross is completely fine. And, um, but it wasn't the cross. Like, I think the focus is often on it's the nails, it was the suffocation. Right. It, and it's like it's that. It's a physical expression of the pain. Right. But the physical was not right. the worst part. Because m way more people have died in way worse ways. Right. And I think I always grew up believing that that was the most extreme, horrible form. And then you would discover other ways that were debatably uh, as awful or worse. And, and that just isn't the focus isn't that the focus is that he was separated from his communion with God. Right. And that is the worst part. And That's that the is the part. and I think what when I started to understand that, I started to understand the gravity of my sin in that it separates me, it like distances me from God. And that's actually worse than the consequences that I experience, the earthly consequences oh, of my wow. sin. Oh wow. I think well, let's let's go into that because I, I think what you just said was really powerful. So the consequence of our sin isn't just a painful experience on a cross, a physical painful experience. Because I think that's what you're relating or a, a, a physical painful experience on earth. Right. It's just, it's, it's actually, because I think a lot of the time when I would like consider, okay, well, I know this is probably sin or I know for sure it's sin, but like maybe I'm going to engage it anyway. It's kind of worth it. Like, I'm like, okay, eh. like, what's it going to be? Like, I'm going to, whatever like the sin would be, it was like, I'm kind of like, I'm braced for the consequence of this one. Like, I right. know it's going to hurt. I'm probably, I might regret it. I might not. But like, I f you can kind of calculate Sometimes you can calculate consequences of decisions and kind of consider that maybe they're worth this momentary pleasure or this laziness or whatever it is that you're going to choose to engage. But the reality is the more painful consequence of that sin is the, the distance that it puts in your unity and your relationship with God. And that's what creates the depression. That's what creates the discouragement. That's what creates the hopelessness. That's what creates the, like, the, the, the void that only Christ can fill is made bigger and made more empty when we choose to sin and separate ourselves further from our connection with him. And right. so when you consider that the worst punishment on the cross wasn't the, all of the agony that was physical, but it was instead the broken unity, well, it helps you recognize that like in our life today, that broken unity actually hurts us more right. than the, like it, it really, it just does. And, and you might not think that it does, but it is hurting you worse than the consequence of like you can screw up your marriage and, and live the rest of your life in pain because you've messed up your marriage. But that's actually not as bad as uh, the lack of repentance of what would happen if you continue to allow that distance between you and God the rest of your life. Right. That, that'd be way worse. Way worse. And, and also it, it might show you that you actually don't have a relationship with God if you have no fruit in your life or if you're allowing that to go on like that, whatever. Well, and also it's hopeful, like in the, in the example of a marriage, it's like if you were to, if you were to choose to wreck your marriage and then experience the, the consequence of that, there is a hope and redemption, not because the marriage is necessarily going to come back together, right. but because your unity with God can be restored and right. you can heal in, even though you're still experiencing some of the consequences that, that's of great. that. Too. That's why the cross becomes so important is because what Jesus does on the cross is he makes a way at any moment for you to have be completely forgiven uh, for all your sin and to have restor a restorative relationship with him. Uh, you can't lose your salvation, obviously. Uh, but what we're talking about here is like there's this part where if you recognize what Jesus has done for you and then you're walking in sin, it's going to pull you back like a beacon drawing you saying like, get right with him. Um, and when you don't, you feel the weight of that. Um, which is brutal, 
And then sometimes God even gives you over to your sin for a season, and you're like, yeah, whatever. And you're only making your life worse spiritually, emotionally, physically, all the things. Right, exactly. And I, and I think it's just important to remem- remember that the consequences that you're bringing upon yourself are not are not the worst part. Yeah, it's Machine Gun Nick, does that resonate with you? Yeah, it does, actually. How so? <laughs> the The biggest... I think thing in my life that that resonates with is the two marriages. The one, first one where I wasn't a very good husband, and then the second one where I had to endure what having not a very good partner feels like. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, oh my gosh, you know. Um, and it's never, it never feels fair, right? right. You're going through it, and you're like, what? Do like, and there was at some point where I was like. I resigned to be like, well, I kind of deserve this, you know. I, uh, yeah. You know, like maybe this is just—it's a time, a season, and it will get better. And then when it never did, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I gotta get out of this. Right. You know, but that kind of, that kind of makes me think of that. Like I did X, Y, and Z, which was not right, and then I go run off with somebody else, <laughs> and like, not even fully divorced yet, just take off with another girl, and go through X, Y, and Z. And you're just kind of like, huh. That didn't work out. Yeah, that did not work out. That was what we would call in the Army piss poor planning. Yeah. Right? So, um, yeah. And so when you, that kind of brought you to a place of rock bottom, I would say, right? Well, yeah, you met me at the, at the Yeah, end. and then that's when you, yeah, that, that Christ was, met you. That's, yeah, that's exactly where, like, <laughs> it was like, something's got to change. Because, like, I, like, we talked about the white knuckling. You, mm-hmm. you say it a lot, and, and I, I've probably repeated it a lot where you're just like i gotta make it through this yeah I, this will end like um or this too shall pass that whole cliche yeah and then you're just like i gotta i gotta go i gotta i can i, I can i can muscle through this like everything else in life and you go on through that and i think what is probably a good 30 years 40 years of that ish <laughs> and then like i'm looking at it like i can't do this anymore yeah, I, I like what you said about like just sort of feeling like whenever you go through hard times, oh, I deserve this. Uh, Adrian, have you ever experienced? Is that a, a thing that you've kind of had to overcome? And that's like probably the Catholic me <laughs> coming well, right. out because what we deserve is hell, right? So, some, but I think sometimes we think it's our good decisions or bad decisions. There are consequences of our sin, right? There are clearly there's consequences of our sin. There's consequences of our righteousness. Consequence of righteousness is is blessing, the consequence of sin is sort of pain, but sometimes, sometimes you experience grace and in in a physical like life way where you don't you don't necessarily have to be Job. Like you don't have to have like the whole world fall on you. And he was one of the most righteous guys ever. And he has a whole bunch of bad stuff that he didn't deserve in a sense, deserve happen to him. And so I think it kind of it can mess with you when we kind of take a karma mindset to God because he does what he wants and he is a father. And so sometimes we can think of like, if it were me and I know I'm a great dad. And so therefore I would do this for my kid. Well, we can't think like that because then that puts us in the, in the place of God. What we need to do as a child, because sometimes when you, you're disciplining your child, they don't know they're going to get the present at the end. They just know that they're sad right now because they have to go to their room or whatever the thing is. Um, And for them, that's like an eternity. And I think that's hard for us to sort of wrap our head around as a child of God to kind of look up at him and trust him with whatever the thing is, whether it's we deserved it or whether we didn't, of just walking in grace, of knowing I have a relationship with my father and I trust him. I think that becomes the biggest part of that. Have you experienced that? Yeah, I do feel like... Well, so here's my thinking with the whole... For some reason, the deserved thing has always been like a kind of a... I've trigger. always had a like, yeah, I hate the word trigger, but a, a, like a trigger reaction yeah. because I think that I was early in my upbringing, I was raised in a pretty like legalistic environment where mm. there was this idea that different sins maybe had different punishments and that, you know, if you choose unwisely how to live, well, then there might be this discipline. And and here's the thing. And there it wasn't all bad teaching. It wasn't all bad thinking. 
but there's there's some some key parts of it that I've learned to just really hold on to because anytime someone talks about deserving like you deserve hell okay right. that's what you deserve and so when someone's like I don't deserve this I'm like you're right you don't you deserve hell is what you deserve and so I think it's really important to believe that and to focus your mind on that mm-hmm. because Anything else, like it doesn't matter how bad your current circumstance is. Right. If you're sitting there feeling like, man, I kind of deserved this. Well, no, actually, you deserved much worse than this. Right, right, right. And I think anything else other than hell is elevating yourself and it's elevating your efforts in a pl- from a place of pride, whether you feel it as pride or not it's ultimately you've elevated yourself. And so it, to me, like, I think it's very important to change the the mentality of like, okay, I made a lot of decisions that and I'm living in the consequence. Like I've made my bed and now I'm having to lie in it. Okay. I think that's kind of a healthy mental recognition. Um, I chose like whether it was who I chose to marry, whether it was who, like there's been several times, like I had some dark years, like when my kids were young and they, and they weren't sleeping and I was like, okay, I chose to have these kids. Granted the Lord, like there is no conception of outside of him. I understand that, but there was some decision that we'd made and like trying for children. And I'm like, this is the consequence of my decision. Like I made a decision to like never have a reprieve, to never have a break and to keep pushing hard when we didn't really have a great balance going <laughs> and we just kept adding more kids. And like, I'm part of me is experiencing the consequence of my choice. Um, and and I think it's important to consider that, but then it's also to co- important to consider that God is a good father, that he does love us, that his desire is to meet us where we are and to, pr- to provide that rest and to provide that comfort and that hope regardless of what the circumstance is. And so in the case of like maybe in your second marriage that you were just describing, it's like God still is a God of hope and, re- and redemption even in, that, even in that bad scenario that is probably the result of, of some poor decision making right. but not that you deserved because what you deserved was actually much worse and i think it's just so important to keep that in line and i and i often with my girlfriends like we joke we've learned to joke about it because jokes seem to be kind of a quick way to like reframe your mindset in a way that doesn't come off so rude but um <laughs> Is this how you help lovingly correct somebody yeah yeah and i think we kind of all do it with each other but there's some there's some mentality that we have a lot of times as moms that like if we believe that we've screwed our kid up on this, on the other side of that coin, when they do something positive, we also are crediting ourselves for that too. And so when you, when one of my friends was like going off one day about how she'd made, I made this horrible decision and this horrible decision. And, and it's, and it's because of these decisions that they're this way and all these. And I'm like, and, and she's probably right in that she's experiencing some consequences of her choices. But at the end of the day, God was sovereign over her choices. God was sovereign over this child's life. God is sovereign over what happens in the future with this child. And so we, like, stop giving yourself so much credit. Right. Because in the same heart that you're giving yourself all this, like, c- condemnation and criticism for your bad decisions— that also probably means that deep down inside you're giving yourself a whole lot of kudos for the things that are kind of going well in them. And that's a, that's scary. And so I, one of the friends, I guess on the flip side of that too, cause I, I feel like, cause people could go the other way. Like they start talking about all the things they've done to make their kid awesome. Right. But if a friend is talking about how they've ruined their kid, yeah. whether they're saying it out loud or not, they're crediting probably mentally how they've also made their sure. kid, how sure. they are. Right. And so it's very important, I think, to stop the negative because you're like, hey, hang on, like you're giving yourself that might too be much the be- credit. That might be the best way to correct somebody overly on the top on the positive is by correcting their negative thinking. Correct. Because that help, that's a way to easily like, you're actually not that great of a parent. You, the God's grace was all over your life. That's right. probably rude. But when you're saying uh, you're actually not that bad of a parent, it's this is this is God's in complete control of like all Like you're that. giving yourself too much credit yeah. is always kind of what we say. Yeah. And, um, or we say like, Oh, you're the linchpin of your family or Oh, it's all up to you. And it kind of helps you remember like, Oh, that's not true. But it right. sure feels true in the moment. Does that resonate for you? Like, do you feel like parenting for a second? Not right now because I don't, I'm not really in their lives. So I don't see like, you don't feel the weight of that. No, I feel the weight of I feel the weight of that. I don't feel any weight of anything good that I've contributed at this time. Right. Because but it's been so long, you know. 
Right. So, so, like, so all the, I guess, like the lack of relationship you have with your children. Right. Is there a part of that, like, oh, I deserve that. I, uh, this is punishment for no, me. No, I don't deserve that. That, that, no. That's something between, that has a little bit to do with the relationship with the ex and some other things. But no, I don't, I don't believe I deserve that at all. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you mean, don't, you're not hard it'd be, on yourself. It'd be about different that, so. if I if I thought I was an alcoholic, right? Or I was endangering their lives when they're with me, or any of the other crap that's accused of me. Right. Right. But I'm not not a druggie. I'm not an alcoholic. Like I don't. You know, like they don't. Well, I don't go and get in car wrecks with them in the car or anything. <laughs> like okay. you know. But so I'm I'm kind of like a little miffed that it it is the way it is. Because I'm like over here, like I'm not all these bad things. I'm not a felon. I'm not. Sure. There's no reason why my kids should be held from me. Yeah. But they, but they are, and so it, that's an injustice, and it's not what God would like. That's not that's not what He would ultimately desire. Right. But he's right. still sovereign within that, and so. But it makes sense to say you're not crediting yourself either way right now. There's this absence where you're probably your only hope is like how God's going to. Yeah. But I do think there is like a, there's God's sovereignty and human responsibility that, that are like intention. And so in any circumstance and situation to your point, you don't want to overly take credit for stuff, but also to your point, you made some choices that right. ultimately led you here. And so you have the, the human responsibility and God's sovereignty are, should be constantly in tension, which means God, because he, because he's connected to your human responsibility, he can override or use it in however he sees fit. That's why Romans eight twenty eight: all things work for the good of those who love him or called according to his purpose. So even in your situation of a divorce, of um, of not having the relationship you would like with your, you'd like to have your kids, somehow, all things that includes that thing works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So I don't know how that's going to work out for good, um, but it will do. Two things. One will be for God's glory and your good ultimately. And that, and it might even be like, you know, I don't have a relationship with my kids like I want. I want to lean into the Lord. I want to lean into, I want to lean into that relationship. So the, the, the recognition of that could cause you to go into, I'm not sure how God ultimately is going to work it out, but I think the one thing that is super important is, is to see that the tension between the God, God's sovereignty and our human responsibility. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, hey, if you've got questions, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can text us at 737-231-0605 or go to pastorpleck.com. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, text in your questions. Just leave a voicemail, whatever you want to do. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we're here to talk about faith, culture, and everything in between. Any other final thoughts before we move on? Oh, I do want to go on one one more thing. Okay. Because I was going to talk about, um, like, is it right to – like to because I kind of where we were going with the question earlier, like, is it actually right to um, to carry? And I think that would be something to look at, like carry a weapon. And um, uh, what we saw in that story was Jesus saying, hey, make sure you carry a weapon so that you can be seen. As, so I, I can be seen as a transgressor. Does that mean he didn't actually want you to carry weapons? Or does that mean you should carry weapons? Uh, what is... What is it? And I and there is no that verse doesn't give you an answer, honestly. No, it doesn't. Um, and there isn't another answer. Like uh, <laughs> remember when whenever John the Baptist comes up to soldiers, he doesn't say, "Hey, lay down your weapons." Uh, sorry, John the Baptist uh, is is baptizing people for the repentance, uh, for the forgiveness of sins, and these soldiers come up and say, "Hey, what must we do?" And they're like, "Hey, don't extort people," and um, you know. Don't make any false threats or uh, accusations. Be content with your wages. In other words, do your job. Do your job well. Execute justice. Romans 13 says that um, you should obey the laws of the king. He doesn't bear the sword for nothing. So, in that, so you know, that's what I always would talk about whenever I was a soldier. Like I am under the authority of a governmental uh, body, and so therefore. Any killing I'm doing in this circumstance is just in the eyes of God, because unless it's like immoral, like you're killing kids or something. Um, but I'm I'm doing it as a uh, an out outworking of His arm because He's in charge of that. And then Psalm 144:1 is where uh, 
uh, David says, you know, uh, I, he prays God who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle, because he, you know, pull the pull the bone arrow. I, I think that there's a part there that there's a honor and it's godly to be trained for war, to ha- to be ready for battle. Um, because when it comes to solving injustice, I don't know. I don't necessarily think we should be involved in vigilante justice. But if some, if it comes to defending your wife and children, I think that's a righteous thing uh, to do. Well, isn't that is said in Scripture that a man is the protector and the provider? Right. And it, providing, I feel, is another form of protection because if you nice. don't provide for your family, then guess what? It's not going to be there. Yeah, and you're worse than an unbeliever. That's that, right. That's, the scripture that's right. So. On that note, I think carrying is your right or, or your duty. Uh, yeah, but you could also say, I mean, this is where it just depends, right? So it, does that mean that people who are not carrying, they're not doing, you know, like that? that's where you go that direction. Um, so I don't want to go that far. So, But I do think it's, it, it's an honorable thing to carry, but I also think it's a very honorable thing not to. So I, I would say like um, when a person who is, they're called to be a peacemaker, right? And so if you're, you know, now granted, there's weapons called the peacemaker, which is kind of convenient. But like w- when you, uh, when you're as a peacemaker, your your entire mindset shouldn't be, you know, shoot first, ask questions later, or here's my deterrent. This will make sure that they understand their place. Uh, it's it's going to be like I want to provide like a a solution that puts that person to understand justice or understand righteousness or whatever. Um, and that doesn't necessarily require a weapon. Um, but I, I do think it's it's important that you follow the law on the one hand. Uh, and so I think this is a debatable matter that, you know, should Christians carry? I think you, you would be you can be a Christian and say, like, all Christians should carry. You, I think that's an okay thing to say. Um, but I think it's also okay to say nobody should carry. I think that's a, that's a, that's a Christian <laughs> thing to say as well. I don't know about that. I don't know about I that. Love you guys. You guys are texting. I, I, I'm going to go with... Maybe you should do what you can. Yeah. So my thing, here's my thing. I don't carry. I have girlfriends that do. Yeah. And I wish I could be like them. Well, why don't but you? But I don't carry because I don't have the ability to be as responsible as necessary <laughs> to be carrying. <laughs> I just don't. I won't remember it. It'll be in like a bag. It'll be in a classroom. I'll walk through the elementary. Like there's too many places I will go that I like. And I'm also... I don't trust myself to have discernment in the moment of when to pull it out, when to engage it, when to use it. And so if some, like right now, if like I scream like I'm going to die when Cody comes up the stairs every single day to my office, I'm scared. I'm, I'm caught off guard. When Chris walks into our bathroom every single day, I scream really loud. So I I don't know what that's about. I wish (laughs) it wasn't that way. I don't know why. And so I don't trust my, (laughs) sorry. Like what am I going to do? Like I, I feel my heart races and I scream and sometimes I'll, if I'm really scared, I'll fall to the ground. Like, so you don't uh. want somebody like that with a gun on them. You just don't. Because what am I going to do? I might pull it out when it's not needed yet, when it's premature. And then the odds of me being overpowered, it being used on me, it being now I'm sourcing a weapon to a criminal. To me, those are all things that are likely to happen <laughs> with my personality, with my whatever. So, But I am so thankful for the friends that I have that are – that are like disciplined enough mm-hmm. and mature enough and controlled enough to like – take the responsibility of responsibly, legally carrying a weapon, I'm so thankful for them. Because to me, they're doing me a favor by taking on that responsibility seriously. And it's not convenient. Like, it's not, it's not, um, it's uncomfortable. It's, but it's like inconvenient to be carrying around a firearm. But they do it, and I view, I view that as like a, a, a civil service. I really do. And so I'm thankful. So like I have certain friends where I'm like really grateful if they're coming with me to something because I'm like, okay, we're, we're kind of safe. Like I get to ride on the fact that they're prepared in the event that something was going to happen. So I'm grateful for those people, but I would, and I would never say we shouldn't, but I would also never say, oh, we all should because I'm like, well, shoot. Like I shouldn't. <laughs> I'm quite confident of that. And so I and I think that we can I really do believe that me carrying at this stage in my life would be would do more harm than good. And so I'm like and not because I 
I can't shoot a gun, what, right? I can. I can shoot a target pretty pretty For well sure. if I don't say so. If I might say so myself, <laughs> but I don't. But in the moment of of a of a need for that, I just don't. I don't trust myself. I don't feel confident. And so to me, it's a choice, and it's a, a that you have to discern. But do I? What I do? I think that it's a that like mass shootings are happening because we have a constitutional carry. But absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think mass shootings are the result of a hundred things before they're the result of gun sales. And even at the point of gun sales, I don't think you can point them to. So this comes to the fault. question: what, what do you do if the government tells you to turn all your weapons? So I have a big problem with that, and I and I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I, I probably would. Yeah, I, I huh? wouldn't. Yeah, if if the government said turn in your weapons, I would I would follow Romans thirteen. I'm not <laughs> turning in my weapons. I'm not even, we're not even going to, I, I'll, forgive me, God, yeah. Jesus, yeah. everybody, I'm not, no. But see, I think you could justify it as not sinful. Like, how? I think, I think you could, depending on how it went down. Yeah, I'd be I tough. mean, we did this during COVID. We wrote oh, a note. there's probably going to be some sinning. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, during COVID, the, the government, the Texas government said masks are not required. And the school board said masks are required. So I'm like, okay. So I wrote a note saying, hey, we are training our sons to follow the <laughs> government authority. The governing authority has said this is an optional choice, and we are not forcing them, and we are not training them to follow unsubordinate authority, which is what the school board was. Right. So th I, I wrote that, that and we were, and my kids didn't wear masks self They were the only kids not wearing masks. It <laughs> was, was the only kids. That's incredible. They were some of the few. No, they were like, <laughs> I think we were the only ones. But, it was, was totally like, weird, no but it was way. great. We're not, I'm not training you that we're submitting to insubordinate authority. However, if the Texas governing, we, and then when the Texas government required them, I withdrew them from school and we took care of education on our own. Right. And mm -hmm. so there is a point where I think it's important to receive so, but this is where I'm like, is it going to be if the U.S. president says, like, give up your it weapons, but then the like Texas governor says not to? If there's a loophole to get around <laughs> it, you believe we're getting around it. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, I don't think we're going to have to deal with that in the next 20 years, God willing. Uh, but it is something that is, that's a question that people always are, are asking is what do you do? And I think you have to consider that you need to be very responsible and prepared, just like he's saying mm -hmm. with these swords. And, and so what does that mean? Does that mean you plot go of property and bury them there? I was about and to wait. say, do you bury them? Do you say I'm relinquishing them and do yeah. you somehow find a loop, I, I loophole? Have no, for I have no we, ownership of these because they're on in my they got property. lost in a boating accident. Right. Yeah. Or do you go to Mexico and or do you, you go find to Mexico a place or for Costa them? Rica? Yeah. And maybe you keep them. I mean, I just think that there are ways around to be submissive to the law, yep. but and not sinful, but also not necessarily comply in the way that is maybe. Being or you could do civil disobedience. Um, yeah, civil disobedience. I think at times was very scriptural. Mm -hmm. So this it's just, is the problem. Is it has it's to not be black something. And white. It, it's not black. Yeah, and white. but it has to be something that it's clearly it's a God thing. Like because you you know in Japan you can't carry a weapon. Well, that's why I don't travel to Japan. <laughs> I mean, the countries that I'm willing to travel to, Switzerland, Switzerland, yeah, Switzerland. <laughs> you can have, you can play with guns in Switzerland, and they're like, yeah, this is great. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, uh, that took a weird turn, but I'm glad we, we had that discussion. He was asking for and, that. And, uh, yeah, you can text in all your questions. We'll probably, this will probably kind of create like a Second Amendment um, like controversy, but that's okay. Hey, we'd love to hear from you. Love to hear from you. Text your questions in. Call. Uh, go to pastorplek.com. We'd love to talk more about it. Uh, it's definitely one of those things where you can be a Christian on all sorts of uh, the aisle on that one and have different different opinion. That's great. We love that. So we'd love to hear from you. From our house to yours, have an awesome week of worship. <laughs>